Welcome to St. John United Church of Christ. It's so good to see all of you here today, and it's good to be back. I've been here before, and every time I come, I think to myself, what a beautiful sanctuary, what a beautiful community, what a blessing. No, remember, no matter who you are or where you are on your journey, you are welcome here. Please stand in body or spirit if you are able to join in our call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. May our worship reflect God's glory. The firmament proclaimed God's handiwork. May we see each other as the handiwork of God. Let our prayer and praise, our singing and proclamation project the love of God. We commune with Christians around the world with Christians throughout time. With Christians across geography and across time, let us worship. Please remain standing if you're able for the processional hymn.
As you call us into your presence this morning, open our hearts and hands to receive, give freely. Make us eager to hear voices of wisdom in unexpected places and to seek your guidance in every moment. Open our minds to the movement of your spirit within us and around us, calling us to justice, compassion, and peace. Open our lives to be transformed by your boundless love, that we may embody your love in all we do. Amen. Gracious God, we confess that our words have not always been a reflection of your love and grace. We have spoken harshly and without hope, hurting those around us and failing to offer words of healing and compassion. Forgive us for the times we have contributed to division and pain without our speech. Transform our hearts and minds so that our words may build up bring home and nurture understanding in a world in need of your reconciling presence. Guide us to use our voices as instruments of your peace and love. Amen. My brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Our God, who knows our hearts and hears our confessions, offers us grace and renewal. Through the boundless love of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God for this incredible gift of forgiveness and transformation. And now, my friends, 
kindness, let us turn to one another and offer each other the sign of peace. Of the Lord, 
In your midst, O Jerusalem, prick the Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good to see all of you here today. In my travels throughout Kentucky, where I get to preach doing pulpit supply, I have to say I always love coming here because of the beauty and the solemnity. Your music makes me feel like we're with the choir of angels and saints, and coming here is a holy experience for me, and I'm grateful. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts give you glory, honor, and praise. You are our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord, and we are grateful. Amen. Who do you say that I am? Is this the question of all questions? I think it is. My friends, I remember when I was a high school religion teacher on the south side of Chicago. I taught religious education classes and I really enjoyed it. But I remember telling my students, in the kingdom of God, I would tell my students, I am really not your teacher. I am your sister. And you, my students, are my sisters and brothers. If you could see my students' faces, I mean, really, you would have laughed. They thought my students back then thought I was a little extreme. I think most of those comments, Miss Diane thinks she's our sister. What? What is she talking about? On those days when I was trying to emphasize what being a kingdom person was, I got a lukewarm response from my students. And can you blame them? My students, and many of them, were very, very bright, but they didn't really want to take the gospel that seriously. Brothers and sisters, you and me, really? But I was their teacher, religion teacher. How could I say less? Furthermore, in Mark 3, 3, Jesus is told that his mothers and brothers are outside, there in the other chapter, but remember Jesus' response, who are my mother and my brothers? Those who do God's will. So you see the way I see it, following Jesus is not really about blood ties and blood connections. It's about a vision of humanity, isn't it? A vision of the world that sees that you and I are all related. We're connected. And whether we like it or not, we're connected. In chapter 8, after Jesus has performed many miracles, fed the 5,000, and been a teacher of many, he asked that important question, who do you say that I am? Today, my friends, it's, it's as if we're being asked that question again. Who do you say that I am here in September in 2024? Depending on your response, your life will reflect whatever the answer might be, right? So this question looms before all of us, and then our life follows suit. If Jesus is simply a teacher or a sage, then Jesus is not so different from other preachers or rabbis or yogis of the Near East. Following teachers or rabbis was not uncommon common back in Jesus' day. In fact, people did this all the time. They found someone who would speak to their heart and then follow that man. But if Jesus is someone really significant, unique, and extraordinary, then the cost of following Jesus might be greater than any one of his disciples might understand. 
following Jesus might lead one not to the mountaintop, but to the valley below. As we read further in chapter 8, right after the passage that Kathy read, Jesus talks about denying oneself, taking up the cross, and following. Now, can you imagine talking to a bunch of teenagers about denying self, taking up a cross, and following? Can you imagine? Can you imagine teenagers back in the day? Teens are just getting started. They're full of awkwardness and struggles to try and understand themselves. And yet Jesus asks the question and then follows up with denying self, taking up the cross, and following. Denying self. Well, back in the day, this was hard to address, but I think it's just as hard now. What does it mean to deny oneself? What is Jesus saying as he continues in that eighth chapter? My friends, following Jesus means that our life is not truly our own. Let me repeat. Our life is not truly our own. Following Jesus means that our lives are God's gift to us. And following Jesus, I'm beholden to the community. In other words, I'm servant, as the psalm said, or citizen of the world, and part of this community, and I'm responsible. And if I want to serve God by following Jesus, then as our ancestors in faith have said, one must follow the shepherd to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that what it means to follow Jesus? Well, if you and I agree, then we all have a lot of room to grow because it's hard to love God with our whole heart and mind and soul and to love neighbors as ourselves. Friends, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say? Furthermore, are we prepared to follow Jesus and to love even those who appear to be difficult to love? Denying self means that we cannot accept the evaluation that our world wants to make of our neighbors or friends. Our opinions and our judgments about who is in and who is out must be cast aside. For example, if your neighbor has few resources or is having trouble finding work, then our world will judge and maybe make statements and be cruel. But you and I, as we follow Jesus, have to be present to our neighbors and to love with a full heart, just as Jesus has. Denying self means that we're not going to use the categories that our word of world uses to judge, to size up, and to evaluate. No, not at all. Taking up the cross. Sometimes you and I are in a difficult moment and can say, this is just my cross. I have to carry it as we deal with difficult family or even difficult neighbors. But taking up the cross has more to do with following Jesus, the persecuted one, to the very end. The cross can be illustrated in our suffering in general, but in a larger sense, the cross is about being faithful even when our life hangs in the balance. Friends, have you ever sat by your mother's bedside when her life was coming to an end? Have you ever sat with a friend who was in a moment of terror, feeling lost and confused? Have you been with someone who was struggling with suicidal thoughts and questions about their worth and value? If you have been with people in these moments, these deep, gut-wrenching moments, then I think you know what the cross is all about. Following and taking up the cross can really rip one's heart out. Being faithful and taking up the cross 
is also a political commitment. Let's face it, Jesus went down to Jerusalem. And this point in Mark's Gospel is the pivotal point. He's doing miracles, he's teaching and preaching, and then, who do you say I am? We must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and Jesus starts to talk about things that are not very attractive because he's going to Jerusalem. And he's not just going there to create a few miracles. He's going to Jerusalem to face the powers that be. Jesus knew what he was about, and he went down to address those in charge and to come face to face with injustice. And Jesus lost his life being faithful to this large vision, to God's kingdom, to a commitment to all of humanity. Jesus and his ministry went beyond tribal affiliations, and let's face it, that got him killed. James Fowler, one of the people I've followed before, who's done research on stages of faith, talked about the conventional level of faith. He talks about people who follow just because that's what we have to do. When I read Fowler's work as a teacher and religious education leader, I really looked into those faith stages. I thought, if we're following Jesus as a safe bet and following for reasons like our family has told us or the tradition has given us or we need security, friends, I don't think we're following Jesus. Following Jesus does not mean that you and I will be safe and secure. Actually, the opposite is true. There can be a deep sense in your bones you're doing what's right, but following Jesus can divide families and nations and political parties and the world. How many of you have had discussions at your own table about Jesus, Christianity, our faith? Have you ever had to say, we have to stop in your families, in your neighborhood, in your world. Following Jesus and wrestling with the question, who do you say that I am, is no small task. Taking up the cross means that you and I cannot be on the side of the powerful. You and I, as Christians, are called to be on the side of the marginalized, the weak, those without power and status. And if you and I do this long enough, someone will not be happy. Someone will take issue. Someone might even be unkind, cruel, torturous. But friends, we must align ourselves with the powerless. We must. Following Jesus in the fullest sense of the word means our willingness to let go of our future in service to something vast and unknown. My friends, I sat down with myself the other day, as I often do in my time of prayer and reflection, and I had one of those hard moments. Have you ever had one of those with yourself? I've made a lot of changes in my life over the years, especially in my work life and ministry. I've worked in many different ministerial capacities with all kinds of people. I had to ask myself a few days ago, am I following God, the God of Jesus Christ, or am I following what's best for me? Sincerely. It doesn't mean the two cannot come together, but sometimes I have found it hard to decide what I am doing. Following Jesus means that we listen with an open and full heart, Following Jesus means that we allow God to determine our future. Friends, some days I know I'm good at letting Jesus determine my steps, my actions, my words, my speech. And other times I want to take charge and tell Jesus there's a wonderful back seat that's comfortable and clean. I'm just being transparent and honest. Following Jesus in Kentucky 
for a girl from Chicago. It's been one of the most amazing and challenging and beautiful and terrifying and gut-wrenching times of my life. But I need to keep laying my life down so that God can direct me and use me. Because when I'm confronted with that question, who do you say that I am? I say, Lord of my life, my salvation, my rock, my inspiration, my joy. Who do you say that I am? It's really no small question, is it? It's the question for all of us. One that maybe plagues us into the night, early into the morning. If we respond to the question in order to be liked or loved or get high marks or to win an election or fill in the blank, that are really are we really letting our lives be are, are we letting our lives being determined by Jesus or the other way around? Does Jesus or Christianity become a snappy title and a catchphrase that might catch someone's attention or eye? My sisters and brothers, I trust that God is walking with you on this journey. And I trust that you are living prayer-filled lives. But I also trust that Jesus' question will continue to work on you and in you as you navigate, as we navigate life's difficult challenges and beautiful terrain. Who do you say that I am? Tough question for tough times. My friends, my sisters, my brothers, may your life continue to reflect your answer as you discern your words, your actions, your attitudes, and your commitments. No, answering is not easy, and living a life in serving, service to the Master a hard job, but you and I are kingdom people, right? Kingdom people. You and I are all connected, and that makes all the difference. We have each other. We are not alone. We are all related, and the God we follow keeps reminding us that to say yes to Jesus means to embrace the body of Christ, which is colorful and beautiful, and complex, and full of diversity, and sin, and suffering, and grace. Amen. Alleluia.
now we come to the time of our pastoral prayer. Before I begin, I want to just invite you to close your eyes for a moment and to contemplate the people, the situations, the loves, the hopes, the losses that are deep within you, so that as we pray, all those intentions may be a part of this prayer. Let's just take a moment here in silent reflection. Gracious God, today's scripture reminds us that words have the power to build or to break, to heal or to hurt. In a world where words are often used carelessly, guide us to choose our words with intention to build up the body of Christ and to spread love and compassion. Holy and merciful God, hear our prayer. Healing God, we lift up those wounded by harmful words, refugees and immigrants, regardless of their status, women and girls facing sexism, people of color subjected to racism, individuals with disabilities who are demeaned, elders dismissed as irrelevant, and young adults labeled as selfish or irresponsible. God of the living word, Help us to seek truth with love and to support one another with our words. Holy and merciful God, hear our prayer. God of healing and wholeness, we bring before you the names and concerns of those dear to us, lifting them up in this silent prayer. and merciful God, hear our prayer. Triune God, we cherish your attentive ear to our voices and our needs. We offer these prayers along with the prayer you taught us as we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we gather our gifts and offerings today, let us remember that our contributions, when combined, have the power to bring healing and hope into our community and beyond. Just as our words can build up and uplift, so too can our collective generosity create spaces of welcome and support for those in need. By pooling our resources, we join together in the work of transforming our world with compassion and justice. Let us give with open hearts, celebrating the good that our shared generosity can accomplish in the name of love and service.
Beloved community, we gather at this sacred table not because we are perfect, but because we are called to be a part of something greater than ourselves. This is a place of grace where we are all welcome and where our shared journey toward justice and love is nourished.
my sisters and brothers, we gather around this table, open to all, to share in a meal that reminds us of the deep and abiding love of God. In this meal, we find not just bread and cup, but a sign of our unity, our shared mission, and our commitment to justice and peace. This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This meal is not about exclusiveness or worthiness, but about the radical inclusiveness of God's love. No matter who you are or where you are, you are welcome here. Through the bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup, we participate in the new life Christ gives. Come, Christ's table is ready. Now we come to the time of our prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for this meal and for the grace it represents. In our shared bread and cup, we are reminded of the unity we have in Christ and to call, the call to extend that unity into the world. Strengthen us as we leave this table to live out more justice to be bearers of your peace, and to share your love with all whom we encounter. We thank you, O God, for this holy meal, for the community we share, 
and from the call to live with hearts open to justice and compassion. Send us forth to be your hands and feet in the world, embodying the love and grace we have received. Please remain standing if you are able for the closing. Amen. Mm-hmm.